Okay, everyone, we're going to make a start on session two of our forum this morning. Before we commence, I'd just like to draw your attention to a couple of things. Um, Vicky has kindly reminded us of the Twitter handle for the event today, which is up on the screen there, and we encourage people to tweet positively about the event and what you're learning in this session. Um, I'd also like to um, plug a um, very important Four Corners this evening, which um, examines um, uh, the, the benefits and opposition to a tax on, on sugar in Australia, um, which is very germane to the um, conversations that we're going to be having today, and particularly Professor Rob Moody's um, session. So we've been hearing uh, in the morning session that WA is leading the way when it comes to public education uh, campaigns and programs and healthy sponsorships. The example, the standout example being there, the um, Live Lighter sponsorship through Healthway of Perth Glory's women's team. And um, all of those strategies are designed, of course, to address the increasing prevalence of overweight and obesity and to promote greater levels of physical activity and, and more healthy eating. While Western Australia is making good progress in softening the ground for debate and discussion regarding good public health policy to address overweight and obesity, it's important to remember that we exist in a world where obesity is an extremely profitable enterprise. We know that big soda and big food um, use unscrupulous tactics, largely based on those pioneered by the tobacco industry to interfere with any attempts at uh, controlling obesity. And that is why today Healthway and Live Lighter uh, are presenting us with an opportunity to hear from some of Australia's leading experts when it comes to navigating the very complex food environment. So first this morning we will be hearing from Kirsten Corbin, who is the Executive Manager Programs Group at VicHealth, the Victorian Health Promotion Foundation. Kirsten joined VicHealth in 2017 and she has more than 16 years of experience in health promotion, including most recently as the Alfred Health's uh, lead for population health and health promotion. At Alfred Health, she led many success, successful initiatives to strengthen Victorian health services, including introducing smoke-free environments, improving availability of healthy food and drinks, supporting active travel, increasing physical activity, and reducing sedentariness. Her work has been shared widely and influenced practice across health, sport, education, and community settings within Australia and internationally. Kirsten has a background in physiotherapy. There's another one, Maria. Mm. We're rescuing the physiotherapists from clinical work. I'm sure that's part of our... Uh... Yeah. Um, <laughs> and a master's degree in health promotion and organisational leadership. So welcome, Kirsten. Do you want to put that on the other panel? Yep. Yeah, okay. I'll leave that for you. And you may have that up here. Yep. Thank you. Okay, thanks Maurice and thank you everybody for having me. Thanks. Um, so the opportunity for me today, I'm going to talk to you about experiences from two different organisations. So as you just heard, um, I've worked at Alfred Health for a long time. So from my physio days right through to lots of health promotion positions and management positions. So Alfred Health, I know is familiar to a number of people in the room, not everybody, um, I guess, given we're based in Victoria. Um, but Alfred Health is a leading um, health service. So we are around three major hospitals, the Alfred being the biggest one, um, Corford Hospital and Sandringham Hospital also existing there. So there are a lot of numbers up there on the screen and really that just shows you that it's a major organisation that has huge numbers of contact with lots of different people. 
Um, and secondly, so since September last year, I've worked with Vic Health. Um, for many years, I've worked alongside Vic Health and in partnership with Vic Health. But I'll also be able to talk a little bit about Vic Health's experience um, in this space of really, really influencing consumer choices around uh, drinks. Um, so first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about the experience at Alfred Health. Um, we did a number of things to really try to change the way um, people were making choices around their drinks. Um, as I said, it's three major hospital sites, um, lots of retail food outlets on those sites. And just to understand the context, those retail food outlets um, are owned and operated by private contractors. Um, there's only one of those outlets that was run by Alfred Health itself. So we really had commercial operators on our sites um, delivering those services for us. They had existing contracts. Um, and if you like long-term contracts, generally we get a retail food outlet contract at a health service, you might have around 20-year terms on it. Um, so start thinking about multiple contracts, really long periods of time before we can actually start influencing those future contracts. You really are, are operating in an environment where you need relationships. And that will be, be shown really strongly throughout these stories. Um, so this photo here, um, I guess, is showing Elf's Cafe at the Alfred. This is only a small part of the cafe. There are lots of different bits to it, but are hard to capture it all in one particular image. Um, it's a fully serviced cafe. Um, so basically you walk up to the counter, you have a look at the food items, you have a look at all the drinks, it's all behind the counter and somebody comes and serves you, you ask for this food item and this particular drink item. Um, so there are no menu board items or anything where it's listed, but basically you look in these glass fronted fridges that are behind the counter for a whole you know, wall of drinks um, and make your choices there. So uh, we've done years worth of work with all our retail food outlets to try to influence the healthiness of the food that's been available, um, adopting the traffic light system, uh, the Victorian guidelines for healthy choices are so using green, amber, red to indicate the healthiness of foods and drinks. Um, and we really had been improving um, in terms of increasing availability of green or the healthier choices and reducing the availability of red, but we hadn't been improving enough. Um, it's been really incremental change over a long period of time and we were just saying, you know, we need to do something fundamentally different. What's going to be a game changer here? What can we do to really take some big leaps forward? Um, so the retailer, his name is Eli, um, so I've worked with him for quite a long time and remember one particular day having a chat with him and really trying to motivate him, say, Eli, we've got to do more. What, what can we do? What other ideas do we have? Um, he was pretty short on, on his ideas, generally philosophically aligned, knowing he operates within a health service, so he needed to have good relationships with our organisation, um, so he needed to be mindful of health. Uh, I was talking to him about what we've learned from tobacco control and I was saying to him things, you know, we, we know that taking cigarettes off display um, is a helpful thing to do, particularly for people who are trying not uh, to purchase tobacco. So what's a similar idea? What might we be able to do around healthy healthy drinks or helping people shift their drinks choices. So I floated in with this idea and said, what, what would happen if we took all of our red drinks, our, our sugary drinks, off display? What if you couldn't see them anywhere? They're still available, but you would never see them um, anywhere. And, and uh, his first reaction was, he said, Kirsten, it will make no difference. Promise you, it will make absolutely no difference to the choices that people make. In that time, he was thinking, what am I going to say? I don't know what to say um, at the time, but pretty much you know, I thought about it really, really quickly and said, perfect, if it's going to make no difference, there's no risk. <laughs> Let's have a go at this. What have you got to lose because people are going to keep doing the same thing you say they always do. So that in the end turned out to be quite a good thing um, to do. And I said to him, Let's have a go at it for two weeks. Let's just go just two weeks. Um, let's take all the sugary drinks that are in those glass fronted fridges and we'll put them in the fridges that are below the counter out of sight. He already had all those fridges, they were also glass fronted. But we spoke to his retailer, his suppliers pretty much and said what if we put decals on all those glass fronted fridges so it was Mount Franklin water pretty much so we covered up all those fridges and they became invisible um, in terms of what the content was so uh, he kept saying but, but you know, don't get your hopes up Kirsten it won't change what people do so I said okay my hopes aren't up let's have a go I need something to do so we actually helped him one night like literally overnight we reset all of his fridges so me and a couple of my team we went in there we took all the sugar drinks put all in those fridges below made sure we had only the green and amber choices so Waters, sparkling waters, even the diet soft drinks were still on display as an amber choice. Um, that's why we didn't tell anyone about it, we didn't do any communication, we just did it literally overnight. Um, his agreement was he's happy to have a go at it for two weeks. So then we were basically keeping a track of what he was selling day by day. So at the end of the first day, we were able to go up to him and say, Eli, you're selling the same number of drinks. So his language, his first, first thing he cared about was total drink sales, unchanged. He's like, oh, okay, the good told you, told you things wouldn't change. And we're saying, but actually you're not selling the sugary drinks, they're dropping, you're selling, selling much more water. Um, he was interested as well because he has higher profit margins on water, the way he's negotiated things. So it's like, oh, okay, this is, you know, this is okay. But <laughs> so we kept saying, no change, we're going two weeks, promise you we'll, we'll keep going for the two weeks. So we're giving daily feedback every day for the first two weeks. And at the end of the two weeks, we're able to go to him and say, Eli, you're still selling the same number of drinks. Um, and for him, he sells around 4,000 drinks a week. 
So a two-week trial, he's still selling 8,000 drinks. But what we were saying was a huge reduction in red, increase in green and in amber. Um, he's, he's not too interested in the secondary fund. He's interested total drink sales be unchanged. It has to be financially viable for him because we're working just on a relationship basis. He's a family, he's got four children, he puts them through private school, he cares about his revenue and he, and he should. Um, we're a health service and we're trying to make sure that we can make a change that's financially viable for him but is having a change um, in the healthiness for the population. So at the end of the two weeks he was impressed, said, I was wrong, you were right, um, well done, okay, now let's put all the fridges back to how they were. I um, said, so hang on a second, this, is, this has worked. Again, you're still selling your 4,000 drinks a week. Um, why don't we go for another two weeks? He's like, okay, all right, we'll go for another two weeks. So we continued for another two weeks and we gave him, again, feedback every single day and then the end of the week and every, in the end of the two weeks, same story. Eli's still selling the same number of drinks and we've got reduction in red. So he says, I know what you're going to ask. I said, yes, I am going to ask and you're going to say yes. So we go for another two weeks. <laughs> um, so we did two-week blocks for six whole months. Okay. <laughs> And I guarantee you he would never have spoken to me if I said, let's do a six-month trial. It wouldn't have happened. So when we start thinking, what do we learn from these sort of experiences? We, we learn about trying to do little discrete changes that can be reversible. And we learn about giving immediate feedback um, to people in a language that they understand and they care about. So here's the percentage reductions we had in, in red. Um, so 28% reduction in proportion um, of red drinks sold. We had increases in green and amber. So again, per percentage reductions on total sales doesn't mean too much just yet when you're looking at these sorts of things, but when we keep saying to him, you sell 4,000 drinks a week, um, start looking at what that percentage reduction actually means and we're saying, if you, can, if you hang on to this for a year, um, it's around, for him, 24,900 fewer sugary drinks that he would sell in that one outlet alone. And that, means, that makes sense to him, he says, oh, wow, and, and, he's, and I'm still selling the same number of drinks and he's making a little bit more profit off water. Um, so for him, he was happy then, don't worry about it, don't keep measuring it, this is just now standard practice for us, we'll never... Um, put those red drinks back on display. So for us, it's a really, really good news story. The thing that I love most about this particular story is we, served, we surveyed 200 people at the end of that trial and two out of 200 people had noticed the change to the food environment. So to, people were completely unaware, let alone concerned about it. People in this environment, they just walked up, browsed what was available, grabbed a drink, um, you know, asked for a particular drink and off they went, completely unaware that we changed um, that environment for them. Um, that particular trial got us quite a lot of attention um, at Alfred Health. It was one of our really big wins um, in terms of moving forward on this healthy food environments. Um, so Eli, the same owner, also has another cafe based at the Alfred. This is Alfredi Cafe at the Alfred Centre. Um, much smaller cafe and a different particular, like different setup really. So this is self-serve drinks, um, whereas the other one was fully serviced. So you walk in this environment, open the fridge doors yourself, you grab whatever it is that you wanted. Um, so I, I was saying to him, we should have a think about what we can do at Alfredi's and I'm in the back of my mind, I'm, I'm not really sure how it's going to go there. And he said, I'll tell you what we're doing at Alfredi's. We're taking those sugary drinks and they're going behind the counter out of sight and all people will be able to self-serve is green and amber. Um, I was a bit worried this time, thinking actually this one might backfire, this might be too big a change and he may actually you know, be putting himself financially at risk, but he was full of confidence this time. Same story, so total drink sales unchanged, a really, really big reduction um, in the proportion of red. People, again, not concerned about it, not, not too aware about it. So we didn't, we didn't tell anyone we were doing these things. We didn't say, if you want a sugary drink, go up to the counter, you'll have to ask for it. It was only people who actually said, do you, if you have Coke, I can't see if you've got Coke. And then someone would grab it for them from a counter, um, from a fridge behind the counter. And we also learned a lot in these sort of situations around what types of red drinks still sell. <coughs> so some still sell, and they are things like Coke and lemonade, things you don't need to see to ask for. Um, but those sort of boutique sugary drinks that come into the market all the time, which we're not too keen about because they, they sort of dress themselves up being healthy, they don't sell because you don't think about them unless you see them. So it really kind of changes the types of red drinks. Um, what we ended up doing, I guess, is thinking as well about our convenience store. Um, this particular trial we teamed up with Deakin University, so Anna Peters um, and her team, and we started to look at other, other interventions we can do in situations like this where it's really hard to take things off display. Um, so this is a convenience store, basically a, a tax lotto agency, um, food and drink, it, and if you looked at the, you know, it's got thousands and thousands and thousands of items for sale um, that are pretty much red, a bit like a 7-Eleven type situation. So we actually designed a third trial here, and this one was around creating a price differential. So making our red drinks, our sugary drinks, 20% more expensive than the amber and green options. So Coke, for example, costs 20% more than Diet Coke or Coke Zero, and the same across all of those different lines um, of drinks. 
So again, same thing, no communication about it. We did go through ethics, we, we did the behind the scenes stuff, but no communication in store or to consumers uh, around what was actually happening. We just changed it one particular night. People walked in um, and saw that particular change. So total drink sales unchanged. Um, so when we look at units and we look at dollars there and we see a reduction in red. Um, still significant when, that, when somebody sells a whole lot of drinks, um, but we're getting ranges, I guess, of different degrees of reduction. What we noticed with this particular one, there are certain volumes of drinks where this, the result was much more significant. So something like a 600 mil um, soft drink is where it actually pushed it over $5. So by adding 20%, that made it $5.40, $5.60. When somebody walks up to buy a drink and somebody says that's $5.40, people go, hang on a second, what's, what's going on? So that really changed people's views and so they, they were really shifting, uh, particularly at those larger volumes. Um, the fourth trial we did at Alpha Health, I guess, was teaming up with Behavioural Insights team from the UK. So they were out working with Vic Health on the Leading Thinker program. So David Halpern and his group, they were really interested in this work that we'd been doing and were really keen to have a look at vending machines um, and trying to find out, I guess, whether there was a change you could play, you know, take with vending machines. So we suggested the price differential again. Um, so we did that and we did that in a randomised control trial. So we basically randomised by the corridor locations. So if you went to the Alpha, there's about 50 vending machines at one particular hospital. It would be hard on one corridor to have intervention and control uh, within the one machine. People would learn they can get different prices. So whole lengths of corridors were interventions or controls um, around that. And again, total drink sales were unchanged and a similar result to the convenience store as well with a reduction um, in the purchasing of red or sugary drinks. Um, at the end of that particular trial, we were able to um, convince our vending provider, um, it was Smith's at the time, um, to maintain that price differential. Um, so we kept saying it doesn't affect you, it's all okay, we're, we're seeing a reduction in red choices and increase in green amber, which is a good thing. So um, they were able to actually retain that um, and they, you know, because we asked them to, so they continued to have across all machines, not just the intervention ones, but all machines where you know, sugar drinks were costing 20% more than the others. Um, we've now led up to the, the process, I guess, around the time I was leaving Vic Health, uh, Alfred Health last September, um, to, around tendering our vending. I never knew I was ever going to learn so much about vending machines either through this role. <laughs> I can tell you a whole lot more than you ever need to know. But um, with vending, we've now actually tendered that publicly. We've now got a provider who's recently been appointed. Um, we did talk in that tender process saying we'd like a new provider to maintain a 20% price differential. Um, and as we're going through that process, we actually wondered, is that the right thing? You know, is that what we should be aiming for? Or should we be actually saying no red drinks? You know, we've got an opportunity at the point of a change in contract. Keep talking about really long-term contracts how hard should we push at this particular point? So we've, we now have achieved at Alfred Health uh, only green drinks um, in vending machines. Uh, we still obviously have got our food outlets, we've got our convenience store on site, so if you need something with caffeine in it or you need another option, you can get it. Um, and if you need sugar, then there's a, a counter everywhere that will help you if you're having a hypoglycemic attack or something like that, which some of our, our doctors talk to us a bit about. So, um, so I think that's a really good thing. We've gone from 50 something vending machines down to 10 at Alfred Health. So there's a few things there. We look, talk about progressive change um, over time and, and there are a few dilemmas and we'll talk, I've got to do a workshop tomorrow, we'll talk a fair bit about some of these dilemmas around this particular topic. But you start to think that we're reducing the sale of sugary drinks but we're increasing the sale of bottled water and where we're going with bottled water versus tap, tap water and we need to you know, think about that as a concept. Um, we certainly have got an overconsumption problem. Um, so sometimes for a retailer you want substitution. Um, when they used to sell a particular item, you wanted to sell another item that substitutes, hopefully it's healthier, but overall we do have people consuming too many things, so I think dropping down the number of vending machines, um, you know, one hospital doesn't need 50, I'm sure of it. So I think there's, there's lots of positives that go with that particular story. Um, so just, I guess, to recap, when we combine all of those drinks trials that have happened at Alfred Health, um, the, the Elf's Cafe, the first trial, is the one that sells the most drinks, and so its effect is, is most significant. When we add them all up every year, um, 36,500 fewer sugary drinks get sold at the Alfred alone. We roll that out at Caulfield Hospital, at Sandringham Hospital, um, and our work at the Alfred was, was working really close with the Department of Health and Human Services as well as a sector lead across the whole of the state in Victoria. So we're working with all health services, so gradually we were seeing more and more health services get on board and make these changes. So that 36,000 um, is much, much bigger when you start looking at the spread. Um, I said part way through that as well that David Halpern and his team with Behavioural Insights Group um, were working with us around many of those trials, um, we're really keen. They were keeping the UK, the NHS, so National Health Service in the UK, in the loop about those, and many might know, I guess, that the NHS are now removing sugary drinks um, across the whole of the country. Um, people ask us around these sort of stories, you know, what about the pushback and what reaction did you get? And they're really keen to know what did suppliers and manufacturers have to say about it, and, and Coke is the qu first question you get all the time. 
Um, so your Coke did have a fair bit to say about this particular process early on. Um, not surprising that their suggestion was that we don't do the trial. Um, again, that it won't make a difference um, to people's choices, well, so that's okay. Again, there's no, no concern for you. If it's not going to make a difference, you're fine. Uh, we're just little and you're big and it's all um, not going to worry. So they did come back a few times. They were really, really keen to get a hold of the results and so we let them see the results the same as the public saw the results. Um, we didn't give them any different access to that at all. Um, what they did talk to us about is their biggest concerns here is protection of their Coke brand. So the red and the white and, and that for them was a really big concern because their Coke brand was no longer visible um, in that particular outlet. It was in fridges below the counter out of sight but all you could see was um, you know, Diet Coke and, and Coke Zero that don't protect that red um, colour. So they were really, really concerned about that. Um, not long after that our fridges became very red. Um, so Coke told us they were going to do something about that and, and true to their word they did. So I don't know if people remember that transition. So basically Coke Zero and, and Diet Coke become mostly red. So the day that it happened, you walk through the, um, the food outlet at Alfred, um, you think, gosh, it's all red again, what's happened? And that's because um, they've kind of redesigned some of that. So they also did talk to us about the fact that they've got an intention to put a red Coke cap on all their bottled water. So they've got a couple of brands of, of bottled water and we're like, that's not going to happen. It's, you know, that, that's just weird and why would you do it? It's not even Coke, but it's just Coke owned. Um, but then it wasn't too much after that fact. I was actually in Uruguay um, at a World Health Organization event and I was drinking water um, that had a red Coca-Cola cap on it. So don't know when that's going to happen for Australia, but it's probably not too far around the corner. So just to touch a little bit, I guess, on Vic Health's experience um, around this topic as well. So as I said, I've worked at Alfred Health, but been in partnership with Vic Health for a long time. So Vic Health are really keen to see some of those drinks trials happening, supportive of a number of them, and really have the huge opportunity, I guess, to take that impact at scale. You know, thinking about the whole state of Victoria and multiple settings as well. Um, so Vic Health's work around healthy eating, we've got a three-year priority there. It's focused very much on choosing water and healthy food options. Um, overall, we're aiming to get 200,000 more Victorians adopting a healthier diet over a 10-year period. That 10-year period goes through to 2023. Um, so as I said before, when we, th we talked about choosing water, so Vic Health's language is about an increasing consumption of water. We'd say the flip side there is that in order to do that, we want to reduce sugary drink consumption as well. Don't want to maintain sugary drink and just increase water, but we need to have some substitution happening. Um, to do that, there's sort of three areas of action for Vic Health, um, certainly around driving demand. Um, increasing supply and nudging behaviour. So those behavioural insights approaches that I talked about in those first few trials, Vic Health saw a lot um, of value in those and really keen to apply them to other situations. So in terms of driving demand, I guess that's really sort of shaping community expectations, changing social norms about what people expect um, in their particular environment. So the H3O campaign um, has been around for a few years now. I know many people will be familiar with that and that's around trying to encourage people to switch sugary drinks to water for a 30 day period. Um, we certainly do see people who go through that particular campaign and, and in the end don't go back um, to their sugary drinks at all or, or to the same extent. Um, we do work with sport, um, certainly bring profile to a lot of our work um, as well, so there are quite a few sports there. Um, big bash cricket teams for Melbourne, so Renegades and the Stars, um, Cadell Evans as well. Um, and then there's that supply angle. When you start increasing community expectation for water, um, that being their drink of choice, then what do we do to make sure water is more accessible um, to everybody? So we have teamed up, um, particularly with the City of Melbourne, but looking at open public spaces and how we can increase access to, to drinking fountains. And not just to drink from at the time, but actually water bottle refill um, as well. So we have spent quite a lot of money with City of Melbourne and uh, that's a great opportunity to do so. We've also think about sports stadia. So Eddie had have been a major partner for us um, and we are you know, currently working with Cadenia Park on negotiating something, hopefully the MCG um, as well. But thinking about these venues being places so many people to get, go to, um, so huge reach and also the association with sport and how we need to really back these up and make them healthy environments. So again, we, we make some investment, um, capital investment into these particular places. We increase access to water uh, for everybody and hopefully have more people drinking free water um, at those events. Um, so thinking about Alfred Health's work around doing those behavioural insights trial and really nudging people's behaviour, Vic Health love those results and, and try to work out how can they take them to scale. Um, what can they do, particularly in sport and rec facilities, being an area that Vic Health funds heavily, um, how can we actually change those food outlets that are in sport and rec um, to remove sugary drinks to some extent. Um, so what, what they actually did with Vic Health, I guess, is to say there are four different types of nudges or, or ways that we can approach behavioural insights to try to achieve some change. So, Red drinks off display is pretty much that concept we came up with Alfred Health. 
So red drinks are still available. We're not saying you can't ever drink them, but they're never on display for you. Um, limit red drinks um, is where you basically try to adopt those guidelines, maybe have no more than 20% of what is available being in that red category. So they're still there, they're still on view, but they're not dominating like they might otherwise. Um, making water the, the cheapest option, so look, creating a price differential and really pricing down water relatively, um, and meal deal. Meal deal was an interesting one, I'm not quite sure um, the idea behind that, but they did have a lot of success where they teamed up um, a bucket of hot chips and a bottle of water. That really works um, if you're trying to increase water consumption, not sugary drinks, but it's flawed in other ways, obviously. <laughs> um, so those red arrows actually show you the two that were most successful um, in, in trialling in lots of sports clubs. So particularly red drinks off display um, is the one that showed the, the strongest success. Um, when I talked about the Alfred Health example, um, we actually already had fridges that were below the counter and out of sight. If we didn't have those fridges already there, I'm not sure how we would have done it. It would have taken much more capital investment, it would have much more thought, um, but we would never have had an you know, overnight kind of implementation of that. Um, but what we've actually done working with some of these sports clubs um, is, is showing some examples here where they've actually been able to take things um, out of sight or off display um, fairly easily. So again, thinking about certain drinks, you can see the examples there where they've actually decaled half of the fridge. Um, the one below is kind of like a bit of a blind inside the actual fridge door um, with the Werribee Tigers basically. So certain um, events they can have, that have it all on show, others they can um, close it off for others. And they do that a little bit with alcohol as well. For, so adult sport, alcohol can be on view and kids sport it's not. Um, so you can have sort of temporary off display and more permanent off display. So a lot of our clubs got really good um, at coming up with some pretty low cost options that didn't mean you needed to purchase a whole lot of other fridges. Um, so we've now taken with Vic Health this water in sport through to local government, um, not just funding sports clubs, but funding local government who have a lot of sport and rec facilities um, and asking them to implement at scale some of these interventions to promote the, the consumption of water and reduce the consumption of sugary drinks. So there's eight councils who've been granted some funds. Um, these councils have been appointed based on uh, a number of selection criteria and need. So where they've got higher than average consumption of sugary drinks, um, they've got uh, higher inequity um, within their community as well. So we've got a number of regional areas, um, certainly Bendigo and Shepparton, uh, Frankston, some of the metro areas as well. Gippsland's getting a bit of money from us as well. So we're supporting them to actually say, yep, this is really important and how can they create solutions in all of their sport and rec facilities. Um, the more rounds of funding we go here, the more normal this action is going to be and the less it's going to be isn't this you know, brave of an organisation taking these steps. We don't want it to be brave, we want it to be super normal. Um, water and sport at Healthy Stadia. So we talked about that earlier as well. So we are giving funds towards um, some of these stadia to do a one-off implementation of some of this new capital uh, to increase access to, to drinking water. Um, so I guess in short, trying to think about what it is that uh, we want people to walk away from these particular stories with is, is I think just an understanding that our environment's are hugely influential over our behaviours or our choices or what we, what we actually consume. Uh, we're often not aware of how influential. And that example of only two out of 200 people and often noticing that change, to me, as I said, is the highlight of that particular story. Um, and so we, we've got to say that our environments influence us for good and for bad. Um, we sometimes get asked a little bit, of, you know, are we just manipulating people's behaviour? Where's the line? Um, because you're, you're steering people to make certain choices. And, and I think that one's a pretty easy one to, to answer and say that our, our food choices are manipulated all of the time, you know, by a big industry. I know Rob will talk about that. Um, as well. So we're just trying to create much more neutral playing field here and, and we're not saying you can't drink sugary drinks, we're just saying you know, it's not going to be on display, it's not going to make it super easy for you um, to do so. Um, so not all behavioural insights trials work, obviously. Um, in this case we did four different trials um, in a health service setting, all four worked. So our message here when we go out to health services is to basically say find the one that suits your environment and, and make it work. Don't worry too much about which particular one. Uh, we've gone into, into lots of sports and rec facilities and council run um, sport and rec as well and, and saying again choose the one that works for you and they help they find it very helpful when we've tried lots, lots of different settings and we say generally this one really works well in your space or this one uh, might work for you. Um, sometimes I look back on those particular trials and think maybe what we were doing was not just nudging consumer behaviour but maybe we were nudging organisational behaviour too um, and retailer behaviour. Maybe there were these small things that we kept doing to make it easy for someone to say yes to the next step but they would never have said yes to that, that full you know, step overall. So. I think that's really important and I think when we're doing this sort of work we need to make sure we share um, our results. So we are up against big industry, um, they don't generally share what they do. So we do have power, I guess as a public health group, when we trial these sort of things we find out what works and what doesn't and when we tell each other um, we've got much more opportunity to create change at scale. 
Um, so in our experience, uh, reducing the availability of sugary drinks is certainly financially viable. And I put that first because I think about the people that we're trying to influence, um, is that we, are, we really need to understand their language and what their motivators are. Um, not everybody is going to be motivated by health gain, clearly. So if we can make some of these changes actually happen that's financially viable, we're not trying to create profit, we're not, you know, we don't, certainly don't talk too publicly around the fact that Eli's profits were up because it was water. You know, that's not something we're trying to say to people, make these changes, you'll make more money. We're just saying we, you can make these changes and not lose money. Um, we say they're really effective, so there's very few interventions I think I've been involved with across my time in health promotion that have created such immediate change in people's behaviour and lasting change in people's behaviour. So that was sustained for two weeks. We went on and reviewed that again 12 months later and two years later um, and the behaviour has been sustained in the long term and at such little cost. You know, what can we do? The change happens overnight, literally overnight, costs us almost nothing to do um, and that level of change has been fantastic. So, and the last point there, I think, is to make sure it's easy. Whatever we're asking people to do has to be really easy. And when we come up with really complicated solutions to things, um, then I think you know, we're very unlikely to be able to make those work that particular time around, let alone at scale. These particular solutions have got really great um, opportunities for everybody to pick it up and run with it. Um, just really quickly, because I've got a couple of minutes left um, to show you some of the other work we did at Alfred Health, is we started looking at nudging people when they were choosing food choices. There's heaps of food available at Alfred Health. So we used a green, amber and red card at every food item. We have 10 green options, 10 amber options and 10 red ones. Some of them are really funny, the me messages that are within there. But instead of just having a boring colour dot or something like that, we actually had a message that was designed to steer people. Um, this work was created by a guy who works at Cleminger, BBDO, so basically a massive advertising company. His other clients are Cabri and James Bogue and so on. Um, he's married to one of the dietitians that I worked with. So when we couldn't source a commercial provider to deliver this work for us very well, uh, he was really happy to do so. Um, what we've actually shown is by mass displaying those particular cards in that same food outlet, we're seeing total food sales are unchanged. So again, people keep buying food at the same rate um, and it, they're reducing the consumption um, of red food, increasing green and amber. So again, another example where it's financially viable. Um, so that particular result um, of, of point of sale communication, what is green, amber and red in one retail outlet, so one cafe at the Alfred at lunch times only, and we didn't even measure dinner time and breakfast time, so it's around 30,000 fewer red lunches would get sold in a year um, at Alfred. So that change has been maintained and those tools have been created in a way that can be shared with so many settings now. Um, on that as well, we've also did some work which I haven't got any images for, is we actually took fried food off display. So we kept saying, well, where are we going to go next? What other changes can we make? And so in that particular cafe, you've got fried dim sims and potato cakes and chips. And I find it really hard when you walk past a bucket of chips not to want them. When you see them and you smell, it is really hard, let alone lots of other people who would have less nutrition knowledge and less health knowledge. Um, so we actually did, did a similar sort of trial where we actually put all the fried food off display. Um, same result again. So I think this has got opportunity to, to go in lots of different situations. That's it. And my team always thinks it's funny to put a photo of me somewhere in my presentations before they send them off, so... <laughs> yeah, there you go. Thank you so much, Kirsten. We'll have opportunities for questions in our panel um, session that follows the three speakers. Um, so our next... Um, speaker this morning um, is uh, Dr. Kathy Chapman and it's a delight for me to welcome uh, Kathy back to Western Australia and I think um, it highlights the close association that we do have with our colleagues at the various cancer councils around Australia. So Kathy um, previously worked at the Cancer Council in New South Wales as Director of Cancer Programs where she was responsible for prevention programs, support programs and services for people affected by cancer and advocacy in government relations. I don't think you're a physio, are you, Cathy, by background? Dial, dietitian, come up, come up to the stage. <laughs> Cathy chaired the Cancer Council's, um, uh, uh, sorry, Cancer Council Australia's Nutrition and Physical Activity Committee and was part of the Australian Chronic Disease Prevention Alliance um, comprising the Cancer Council Australia, the Heart Foundation, Diabetes Australia, Kidney Health and the Stroke Foundation. Cathy has significant expertise in the issue of food marketing to children. 
She's been responsible for a range of strategic pro uh, research projects to underpin advocacy efforts around the reduction of food marketing directed at children. This has involved measuring the extent and nature of food marketing directed at children across a variety of media, including television, internet, magazines and point of sale. This research has produced more than 70 academic publications used in advocacy work in a variety of government submissions and initiatives and extensively reported in the media. So please join me in welcoming Cathy. Thank you very much, Maurice, and also a big um, thank you to Jenny and Steve from Cats Council WA and Maria for inviting me over here. So it's been lovely to come over to Western Australia again. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today and pay my respect to elders, both past and present. So um, I'm going to talk about the other side of the live lighter coin. So um, coming from New South Wales, I'm very um, jealous of the great um, health campaigns and, um, you know, and I know they're much more than mass media campaigns, but when I look at what we have in New South Wales, it's nothing compared to the success of, of live lighter. But the, ch the challenge is definitely what else is coming out of the television, um, as well as a whole range of other media channels, is very much the opposite mes message, the an antithesis message there. So if we go back and um, look over time, certainly um, food marketing to children has changed. We don't see um, soft drink bottles being forced into the face of um, young babies and McDonald's has got even more clever and they don't talk about the protein needs that their, um, their burgers and their chips provide. But we still see just such a range of what the places where we see all the food marketing happening. So, um, you know, embedded in, um, KFC pro programs, you know, in sport, the way McDonald's ties in with um, popular children's movies, outdoor advertising, when you're going to recreation settings like the aquarium, you're going to be um, reminded to have a soft drink when you're in supermarkets. Um, it's lots of places and definitely, you know, the sports sponsorship is a really, really, really big part, part of it as well, outdoor advertising, so on train stations, the, um, the vending machines, there's just so many ways where we can see um, these messages for the wrong sorts of foods and, you know, internet as, as well. Oops. So we know that um, there is this direct causal pathway, so food advertising is going to lead to an increase in pester power. Um, and that's also going to be influencing food preferences, which in turn will lead to um, increasing the consumption of junk foods, and that's going to contribute to the increased risk of overweight and therefore also the increased risk of chronic disease. Where we've actually had most e evidence is about what's the extent of the food marketing um, to children, but we are starting to get some of that direct evidence of how it is actually leading to the increased consumption of food. So I'm going to talk about some of the studies um, that are around, looking at the extent of um, the exposure that children are faced with, but I'm also going to talk about one particular study that's giving that direct evidence of the, the impact that it's having and then I'm going to talk um, about some of the advocacy campaigns that have happened and um, the food industry's um, own regulatory codes and where all the loopholes are with those. So tipping the scale, so that's the name of the Four Corners program that will be on tonight. So this um, is, um, and Maria mentioned this in her presentation this morning, about 35 different um, public health organisations have come together and um, decided what are the eight most essential things we need to be um, tackling to look at obesity. And that num first number one, one that you know, 35 different um, health groups have come up with is the importance of toughening restrictions on TV junk food advertising. So if we look at TV um, food advertising, so there was a study that came out about a fortnight ago um, and it was actually funded through a Heart Foundation grant, but it's from South Australia. 
So they've got a, developed a new bespoke model of being able to monitor all the food, all the ads on TV. And what they found in this study was there were something like 800,000 ads shown in 2016, and 11% of all those ads that are on TV were for food. So that's nearly 98,000 food ads shown across, across a year. The most frequently advertised categories were snack foods, um, crumbed and battered meats, followed by fast foods and um, sugary drinks actually is in fourth place there. So the frequency of unhealthy food ads is something like 1.7 ads per hour. But if you look at the times when children are actually watching their most popular programs, so their peak viewing times, which tends to be about usually between seven and eight in the evening, the frequency and the duration of the food advertising for unhealthy foods actually goes up to 2.3 times per hour. And this study was also interesting. It looked at um, when were the biggest concentrations of this, um, unhealthy food advertising. So discretionary foods made up about 41% of the, of the ads in August, um, but if in January, it was about 71% of all food advertising. And I'd say that's very much the cricket phenomenon of KFC and all the, um, when you've got wall-to-wall -wall cricket on during Jan January, that's definitely when food advertising goes up. So this study concluded that over a year, children would view more than 800 junk food ads each year if they're watching something like 80 minutes of, of TV per day. So that's quite a lot when you think about it from that cumulative factor. So for food regulation, we know that there is actually children's TV standards. Um, so that's um, the government form of regulation. So that only applies to dedicated children's programs and preschooler programs, which tend to be the ones shown on the ABC. Um, and the regulations around that is not to have, have advertising. Then the broadcasters have their own um, commercial TV code of practice. So they've got a little bit of a mention about not having anything that's too misleading, but really that doesn't have any, any strength behind it. And then in about 2009, the food and advertising industries got, got worried and they actually introduced some self-regulatory codes. So um, the food companies got together and through the Australian Food and Grocery Councils, they introduced the Responsible Children's Marketing Initiative and the fast food industry came together under the quick service restaurant industry. And then the, the advertising um, peak body also um, introduced their own code as well. So we've got a whole range of these industry-driven codes, which are really not worth the paper that they're written on. And we have got the TV standards, which don't actually say enough in terms of addressing the unhealthy food advertising. So I'll show you a little bit more about um, some of the studies, and then I'm gonna go through the, the loophole in these areas. So again, there's been a lot of studies talking about since the introduction of these voluntary codes, it really actually hasn't made much difference in terms of what children are being exposed to. And one of the studies that I've been involved in, so Cancer Council has been actually monitoring the amount of um, food advertising since way back in 2006 and doing it at regular periods of time. So the line down the middle in 2009 is when the industry codes of practice came in. So we have been seeing a bit of a decrease in terms of the amount of food advertising that happened, but where we are currently the, at the last time the study was done is we're really still seeing very similar amounts. Um, there's not really been much of a decline in terms of unhealthy ads, and if anything, we've seen a slight increase in the amount of fast food advertising that's happening there. So we have evidence there that since the introduction of these industry codes of practice, it's not really led to a change in terms of what children are seeing on TV. Um, this next study that I'm mentioning here um, that I've been involved with is led out of the University of Wollongong and this is actually a really noticeable study and it was just published only last week. It's actually the first direct evidence um, of a study that we have in Australia that looks at how does um, being exposed to advertising change um, children's food behaviours. So it was an RCT of children that were in vacation care, so at holiday camps, and we had a group that were exposed to TV food advertising and also to marketing in an online game. 
um, and there was also a control group. And what we found was the group that had the online advert game um, combined with the TV advertising, that was a much stronger effect on their food, food consumption than just the TV advertising alone. And we actually monitored the amount that the children were eating at the morning tea break immediately after they'd been exposed to this um, food marketing and also at their lunchtime as, as well. And it was the, these children actually ate 194 kilojoules more um, at their next snack from when they'd seen the, the food marketing embedded in, in the activity that was happening. So this amount of an extra 194 kilojoules has definitely got the potential for cumulative weight gain over time. So again, another big strong piece of evidence in the, in the puzzle. So definitely food marketing happening um, in digital media channels. So this is some examples of um, the types of food marketing um, that food companies put on their websites, so Cadbury and Fedro um, chocolate, so really trying to get children to register, link in with competitions as well. So this is an old one from um, Coco Pops as well, so definitely targeting children. So a study that was done a while ago looking at popular children's websites at the time, when we looked at the amounts of the food food that was advertised, usually it was about 61% um, were for unhealthy foods and 40% were foods that would be classed as healthy. So I've got a couple more slides that I'll show that have these sim similar pie charts and what you'll always see is the red unhealthy always makes the big, the big chunk of the pie. Um, the sorts of marketing features that were used on food product websites, so you know, tying in with sports celebrities, having cartoon characters, um, kids clubs, um, embedding things in games were also <coughs> popular, but also um, just doing advocation, so using the, um, the advertising to try and be educating on the value of those particular products. <coughs> These are some examples of food marketing in children's magazines. So, um, and this again is a study from a little while ago where um, you, know, you see things like you know, these big double page spreads with um, tie-ins with McDonald's and the latest movies, the paddle pop line, again links with competitions and the guy candy one was always one of my favourites so that was in a teenage girls magazine and it um, likened them to think about the boyfriends they might find of what piece of candy they might be like. And again, um, looking at the, the different food references that we found in these magazines, 64% were for unhealthy. Packaging promotion, so what you see in the supermarket aisle, so again, you know, Nutrigrain and that sports link has been around for a long time, um, movie tie-ins, cartoon characters, and again, competitions and premiums as well. So again, when, um, you know, looking, doing a study where you walk up and down the food aisles of um, supermarkets and look at all the, the use of these premiums, they tend to mostly always be put on the unhealthy food choices. Um, and it was confectionery, which was the category of food that uses a lot of these, these particular promotions. So I took out my examples about sponsorship um, in sport because I'm actually covering that in my workshop tomorrow. Um, but I'll give you some examples of some of the studies for outdoor advertising um, examples. So there's been a study looking at outdoor advertising around schools, and this was um, looking at about 40 primary schools around Sydney and Wollongong. And there was something like over 9,000 outdoor ads identified around within a 500 metre radius of the schools. And of those 9,000 outdoor ads, um, about a quarter of them were for food. But it was 80% of that, all those food ones were actually for the unhealthy foods and mainly soft drinks and alcohol. And this study showed that the closer the ads were to the school, they tended to be more, more unhealthy. So it was compared how many ads were seen within a 250 metre radius of the school compared to the 500 metre radius of the school. So a recent study from um, Public Health Advocacy Institute in WA that came out 
just last month, I think, um, looked at the outdoor advertising at bus shelters near, near schools. Oh, I think they're all tweeting about me now, um, <laughs> pulling out their cameras. Um, so th they found 293 advertisements, and of these um, bus shelter ads, 31% featured unhealthy food products, and only two of the 293 were actually classified as um, unhealthy, as being healthy. So again, that's a really small drop in the ocean. There's also been a study looking at rail stations around Sydney, and this was a study of all 178 train stations in Sydney, um, and it was done in winter and summer. There was about um, nearly 7,000 ads, so, and again, about a third of them were for food. 84% um, of them were those discretionary choices, um, and Coca-Cola and Pepsi were the, the biggest advertisers on the train stations. So ACT has actually um, just recently introduced a policy that's going to be um, that is banning junk food, alcohol, and gambling advertising on the Canberra Action buses. Um, so in Sydney, we'd never get away with calling our buses actions because there's a whole lot of um, transport issues that we have. But it's really great to see that in ACT, their buses can't um, advertise things like weapons, but also now they can't advertise things like junk food, fast food, or unhealthy food or drink, and they've defined it by the Australian Dietary Guidelines and the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating and also alcohol. So I know last year in um, Perth, when in the lead up to the state election, um, the Labor government backed that they would um, ban booze, as, um, booze ads on buses, and this was reported on in, in the paper. Um, I think it's yet to be actually introduced, but it's great to see that at least it was being recognised, and it was um, recognised because of the work of the Alcohol Advertising Review Board that found um, a quarter of the advertisements at bus stops were for alcohol products. So, I'd mentioned before about the different food regulation um, codes and what some of the, the loopholes are. So the very first loophole is that many companies are not actually signatories to these industry codes of practice. So a study that we did a little while ago found that of the 60, 36 companies that were advertising on TV, only 11 of them were actually signed up to these the Responsible Children's marketing, marketing Initiative. And so, you know, there were 11 um, that were actually signed, signed up, but they were still advertising. So again, it's not really that big a thing to be celebrating. The biggest rot that we've got in terms of um, the food regulatory, um, self-regulatory codes is they talk about, it's only about media when the audience is predominantly children. And they use this percentage that it has to be when there's 35% of the audience or more that are children watching and that's when they wouldn't be advertising. So the big problem with that is you never actually have any programs that achieve 35% of the audience being children. So they must have absolutely known this in terms of their media monitoring data when they set these codes. So to give you um, the example, uh, during P and C programs, which should probably be shown say at four o'clock in the afternoon, you'll have something like 80,000 children watching at those times. And that might be, um, you know, a reasonable proportion of the audience, but you're going to actually have much larger number of children watching between seven and eight, so something like 500,000 will be likely to be watching in the evening time, but there's also going to be a lot of adults watching at that time. So again, um, another part, piece of, you know, honing in on this point, the Obesity Policy Coalition got viewing data on the 20 most popular pro children's programs and found that most of them only ever achieved 8 to 20% of a um, proportion of the audience being children. So, you know, we've got these codes written by the food industry saying they won't do things when it's 35% or more. Well, they're quite safe of not having to do th something like that. Um, the other thing with these, these self-regulatory codes is it's up to the food companies themselves to set their own nutrient criteria. So each food company has, can set their own action plan um, and of course they're going to use quite variable criteria and usually the weaker criteria. 
So this is one of my favourite slides. So this shows um, the energy threshold that the different companies have chosen to use. And the line across there is what the Heart Foundation used to use as part of its TIC program and what the School Canteen Association thinks is a better kilojoule um, cutoffs of 600. So all the other companies have set something quite a lot higher, but they've all set different ones to, to each other on them. And another loophole is that the industry codes don't cover all types of media um, and advertising. They do talk about te television advertising, but none of them actually include outdoor advertising as part of it. Um, and if you make complaints, um, it goes to the Advertising Standards Bureau, and again, Maria talked about an example that they had made, but the Advertising Standards Bureau really has no power to actually impose any, any sanctions for breaches that it finds, so it's a bit like just getting a slap on the wrist with a feather, as opposed to it being, you know, a sledgehammer change. And, you know, some complaints are upheld, but it's usually quite a while after the advertising campaign has happened. There's also been quite a few studies looking at, well, what's community support to see, um, you know, a ban on um, unhealthy advertising to, to children. So this is a study that was done at Cancer Council in New South Wales a couple of years ago. Certainly community support is strongest for things like having clearer food labels. Um, but they are also, you know, more than about two thirds are in support of seeing a ban of un unhealthy food advertising. Not as much community support around the taxation or the increasing price. People are not so keen on that, but we can definitely say the vast majority are in support of seeing that there should be more regulation in these areas. So in terms of um, looking at the policy in this area, I, th I sort of describe it as a timeline of in action or sort of, that's often quite sort of depressing when you talk about how long you've been um, working in this particular area. So the children's TV standards, you know, I got really excited um, 10 years ago in 2008 when they were going to be reviewed and we brought together a whole lot of different groups um, under a particular advocacy campaign, which I'll show you a picture of in a, in a second. And we thought we can really, you know, look at this as an opportunity and present the evidence, present um, the strength of community support, but they didn't change the television standards then. What we did see the following year was that, you know, food industry and the advertisers were getting worried and concerned, so they introduced their own self-regulatory codes of saying, you know, don't regulate us, we can regulate ourselves. Um, also got excited when the Preventive Health Task Force was established in 2010. So there was a task force on obesity, one on alcohol, one also looking at tobacco. And definitely food marketing featured really strongly in terms of the recommendations that this task force made. Then there was the formation, um, but unfortunately also the demise of the Australian National Preventative Health Agency, where we thought a lot of these recommendations would go to and um, have the chance to be introduced into to policy. And I think every time there's also been a federal election, you know, groups like um, Cancer Council and Heart Foundation have come together and pushed for this to be a policy area, but we haven't got those particular things happening. So, showing you some of the advocacy campaigns, they've all borrowed on um, the campaign model of thinking about building up the strategic research, using that for media advocacy, of raising it in, in politicians' mind as well as the community's mind, trying to bring in grassroots um, um, community support around that and have all those prongs coming together to hopefully change politicians' minds and when there's, you know, the chance to be at responding to submissions and doing consultations and working in partnership, that all comes together as part of the, the advocacy model. So there's certainly been a lot of media advocacy. Um, oh, Come back to the other one. So the pull the plug was the one um, was the campaign we led during the review of the children's television standards. So it was actually a postcard campaign where we got members of the community to fill out postcards so, uh, that were then directed back to the communications and media authority who were conducting the review, so that they could see that there was strong. Um, community support around around this area, and we collected something like eighteen thousand postcards. 
cards and you know that was right around the country we took them all down to um, the communications and media authority um, and you know they were thrilled to get so many of these um, postcards um, but we also then you know helped a lot of public health groups write submissions on these particular areas and again I think there were about 60 submissions from the public health side compared to about 20 submissions from industry groups but it didn't lead to them being there being sufficient change and I think their argument at the time was they didn't feel that the evidence of those direct effects were strong enough and now hopefully we're seeing a bit of an increase there. Junk Busters has been another um, particular campaign. So this has sim some similarities to the Alcohol Advertising Review Board, which tries to help generate those community complaints about objectionable um, examples of food marketing and help to try and make the more complaints about them. Examples of it. That's been refreshed into a new campaign now called Our Kids, Our Call, which again is about trying to help raise that community awareness about the manipulative tactics that the food industry is using. So again, last year there was a little bit of excitement um, because in the lead up to the federal election that um, Bill Shorten was on record at a doorstop in Brisbane saying, this is something we've got to think about, you know, the ability of junk food to be advertised at times on television when kids are watching. So hopefully that's a little bit of peeling away. But definitely we've seen um, the World Health Organisation, you know, recognise its, its importance there. So summing, summing up, hopefully I've shown you that we really do have evidence that food marketing remains high and I think that's both in terms of the volume and the power of the persuasiveness of the tactics that are being used by, by food industry. Um, we have evidence that food marketing impacts on food behaviours to the detriment of weight. Um, evidence that the industry self-regulatory codes have not made any dents. Um, and evidence that there is community support for action. So in terms of you know, next steps so um, of this, we certainly need to be keeping the pressure on in terms of media advocacy around this and also the research that can help to keep contributing. Um, the countering the nanny state arguments is such an important part of it. And there is um, lots of examples of local opportunities and I think definitely roles for state state governments and local councils. So if we think about TV advertising, that does definitely come under the, the national, um, national jurisdiction, but it's going to take state governments to be putting this on the agenda at COAG and helping to push that along. State governments can definitely be playing a role like ACT has done in terms of banning the, the advertising on public transport. Local councils are going to be playing a role in terms of you know, what we're seeing on our, our bus shelters. So we've got to look at how we can um, muster those different opportunities. And as we also heard this morning, you know, the sports sponsorship of taking that up as well. So just a thing and you know, fitting with the theme that the environment is important. It's not just about the willpower of individuals there. And just want to acknowledge my um, nutrition colleagues at Cancer Council and my research colleague um, Bridget Kelly and um, Leslie King from Sydney University as well as the Behavioural Research Centre at Cancer Council Victoria. So amongst all of us um, plus other, other groups um, there is a lot of good research advocacy happening but it's about bringing it all together to, to get that political advocacy moving. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Cathy, for that terrific presentation. Um, before I um, introduce um, formally our next speaker, Professor Rob Moody, I would like to acknowledge um, Healthway uh, for their support in sponsoring Rob Moody's visit to Perth um, and to this session today. Rob's speaking at Science on the Swan tomorrow. Um, now, um, a few of you will remember when we launched the Live Lighter Sugary Drinks campaign in 2014 
and Rob was our special guest. And um, within um, an hour, the Beverages Council of Australia put out a media <laughs> release <laughs> criticising the campaign and all that it stood for and, um, of course, offered their views about sugary drinks having no role in the development of anything that's harmful in terms of your health. And I think the immediate response we got had a lot to do with the fact that we'd enlisted Rob's support in that launch. Now, Rob also, um, in the last four or five years, has been a leading author advocating uh, and raising awareness of the commercial uh, drivers or determinants of um, death and disease. And um, I'm delighted that we have him uh, here to address this morning. Um, Rob is currently Professor of Public Health at the College of Medicine in the University of Malawi and Professor of Public Health at the University of Melbourne School of Population and Global Health. He was trained in medicine, uh, not physiotherapy. Uh, don't, I'm not against physios, I've got one in my family, my daughter's a physio. Um, he trained in public health um, and medicine and has worked in refugee healthcare, the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Service in Central Australia, HIV prevention for the Department of uh, Health Department of Victoria and he was CEO of Vic Health from 1998 to 2007. From 2008 to 2011, he chaired the National Preventative Health Task Force in Australia, mentioned by Cathy in her presentation, which recommended the introduction of plain packaging for tobacco. Um, he now chairs the Derby Vaccine Alliances and advises the World Health Organization So it's a real delight to welcome back to Perth, Professor Rob Moody. Hello. No. Does that work? No. It's okay. Okay. Thanks, Maurice. Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity uh, being here. And thank you, Healthway. Um, I love Healthway uh, as much as I love um, Vic Health, uh, having been associated with both for uh, uh, for so long. Um, and I'd like Kathy. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians uh, of the land we uh, were gathering on, and just to say, I mean, how important um, these issues, and particularly the issues I'm going to talk about, are to Indigenous populations um, and to all of us. And I'd also like to acknowledge. Um, the two previous speakers. The wonderful thing about coming to a meeting like this uh, is to hear uh, Kirsten and, and Kathy and um, and learn from them. So, uh, uh, and I, I guess one of the I'm going to be talking about some deep and dark and nasty things, um, but I don't want you to get I want you to be excited or angry or furious um, and uh, work out where you can take these issues like um, like Kirsten and Kathy. Uh, doing and like Live Light is doing. I mean, this is our, there's some big, big struggles out there, but it's want some wonderful opportunities to do some, uh, I think, to do some really, really, um, uh, really, really good things. <coughs> but first of all, I just wanted to, I guess, have a health warning. Uh, and I've been talking a lot about supranational corporations, um, and I just wanted to make, I'm not at all anti business, anti uh, corporations. Uh, we, the best thing you can do for someone is actually give them a good job. You know, that really good, you know, for someone's health, we know how important employment is having a meaningful job. So we need industries, we need businesses, but we do need to stop talking about the private sector or the corporate sector as a homogenous entity. These are incredibly, am amazingly diverse organisations and types of organisations. I'm just against the nasty ones and the really unhealthy ones. That's what I really want to talk about today. But I also want to th get you to think about how can we work with businesses and industries that are actually creating wealth and health at the same time uh, that we can work with. Because if we don't, 
if in a sense we're, we're jammed against business altogether, we'll be pushed off by the politicians completely. So we've got to work out where our partners are. And Kirsten gave a great example of that before of working with good relationships with industries, with businesses, with groups we can actually work with. We've got to find them and work with them because there are many, for example, the life insurance industry, they actually want people to stay alive and stay well. Uh, similarly, the health insurance industry, telecommunications, a lot of different sorts of groups, uh, investment bankers, as long as they're not from AMP, um, <laughs> then you know, these are people we should be able to, to look at. And I want to talk about, we've talked a lot about in the past about multinational corporations uh, and now transnational corporations. I'm going one step further. I mean, they're multinational corporations because, in a sense, they have no allegiance to a particular country. They live in and they work in a whole range of different countries. Their allegiance is to their, uh, their, uh, their shareholders, even though they're not, in a sense, they, they're deemed to have that, that responsibility. But in the past, as we were, had this discussion last week, companies' businesses were actually there for the sake of society. It wasn't just for the sake of their shareholders, they're actually there for a purpose of doing good within society. Well, anyway, now we have what I would call supranational corporations. Why supranational? Well, when you look at the 100 biggest economies in the world, of the 100 biggest economies in the world, how many do you think are corporations? Sixty-nine. Sixty-nine out of the world's a hundred biggest economies are corporations. They're not countries. The corporations. Walmart makes more money than Australia. So if you're a government in Africa, for example, a small government in Southeast Asia, then you've got no hope against these these guys. I mean, these are big deal. They have got the money, the power, and the influence. So the nature of how decisions are made. Who has the political influence, who has the power over what is happening is starting to change quite rapidly. And this was reversed about, even about five years ago. So it's changing um, fairly, uh, fairly rapidly. And just an example of how they consider themselves, then if you look at Anheuser-Busch, which has now become the biggest, by, by virtue of a, a recent collaboration, um, the biggest uh, beer company in the world, we're no longer a neighbourhood's beer or a country's beer. We're a, corporate, a corporation representing the world. So that's how they see themselves and that's how they operate. So I wanted to talk to you about, I guess, what are some of the, the, the tactics, and, and Kathy's already alluded to them, um, uh, in, in the area of junk food and junk drinks, uh, that they use. Um, reason, because that's part of our, if we're working in public health now, or health promotion, this is part of our daily job. We have to understand how these groups work. And Cathy's, again, just given us a whole lot of different uh, examples of how uh, they will circumvent or change or undermine public health. The classic one was with the, uh, the um, uh, Preventive Health Task Force in 2009, actually. We had a woman on it who was the head of the uh, uh, general practice, uh, division of general practice, who then got immediately, as she came onto it, was uh, recruited by the food uh, the, and advisor, the global, what is it? The, the Food and Grocery Council of Australia, um, who then managed to bring in these uh, codes uh, to make sure that the government wouldn't bring any uh, compulsory codes in. That's what they call regulatory capture. So instead of waiting for something that might have happened from government, they jumped in and, and then, as Cathy pointed out, produced a code that's absolutely useless. You know, the code focused on children's viewing time, and as she's just said, children don't watch TV in children's viewing times. They watch it in adult viewing times. Uh, and they knew that. So what are the tactics that they, they used on? They will attack legitimate science. And we're seeing this throughout the globally, but particularly very strongly in the US actually, in the area of, of climate change more than anything else. Um, but uh, a classic case was here with, with um, uh, marketing, with the uh, uh, plain packaging. Um, and we saw, after we introduced this in 2012, about two years later, uh, I get a call and in the morning, there's a, a headline in the Australian. And funnily enough, it's Labor's plain packaging fails as cigarette uh, sales rise. 
completely false data. The, the, the Department of Health came out with the correct data and, and the finance came out with the correct data a couple of days later. The point was why, was, why was this front page news anyway? Well, the point was this particular news organisation wanted to be able to quote these headlines in the UK and in Ireland as they did several days later because the UK and Irish governments were thinking about plain packaging. And the fact that Rupert Murdoch was on the board of uh, Philip Morris for eight years has, of course, nothing to do with this. <laughs> but this is where you're getting the power and the joining up of major organisations to push um, a particular uh, point of view and to attack legitimate science. And, of course, they attack the scientists. This is Lisa Barrow from uh, University of Sydney, formerly of UC UCSF. She's been targeted, we know now, from a whole email trail by Coca-Cola, why? Because of her work on, uh, on, dri on uh, sugary drinks, but also on, on the bias of uh, industry in, in funding research. Um, and of course, we've got some of your own, whether it's Melanie Wakefield or Jane Martin um, or Mike Torb. I mean, and it's interesting, Mike's done a very interesting piece on uh, tobacco in this morning's MJA Insights, really worth having a look at. One of the things he noted was how much more they are being attacked uh, than previously. So. That's okay. Just if you get attacked, like you're really doing well, you know. <laughs> Wear it as something that's like a scout's badge, you know. Um, and so that's a, it's a not necessarily a bad thing. It's not particularly comfortable, and that's why, we, in a sense, we need to be able to support each other, because if you, you know, if you get into the space, the industry will attack you. There's absolutely no doubt about it. You make a public noise then they will, uh, they will attack it. We've seen this time and time again. We're seeing it in, in the area of climate change really very strongly and they will really go for you and your reputation. Um, this is if you're in, it's slightly more dangerous if you're in Indonesia. Um, and uh, Abdullah Hassan, who I work with, uh, told me he was pretty upset one day when his mum rang him up and said, why are you on a billboard, Abdullah? Uh, and why are you being called an enemy of the tobacco farmers and cigarette workers? And this is, of course, something funded by the, um, by the uh, tobacco industry. Um, but these guys have been attacked. Uh, people in Nigeria have been actually physically attacked uh, and uh, 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 attempted to kill them uh, who are against the tobacco uh, industry. So that normally doesn't happen here. Um, but <laughs> it... It is a point, that's, a, that's an industry tactic. Have a go at the science, have a go at the people that are doing the science. You create your arms, friend organi arms uh, length organisations. These are the classic ones in tobacco that actually no longer exist, but they are now being regenerated. And I'll show you the, the most recent one, which is the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. Uh, but this was around for 40 years, producing you know, consistently um, false evidence, uh, trying to undermine uh, the science, of course. Um, in the area of, of um, alcohol, the International Centre for Alcohol Policies um, and Drink Aware and Drink Wise, as we see now, and you'll see in all the sporting uh, uh, games now, the big games, Drink Wise will have their, their brand there. That's what I would call, and that's just as we've had brand, uh, regulatory capture, this is what I would call branding capture. This is they're saying, we're putting our brand in there to actually block uh, any public health branding or health promotion branding. Um, and the last one, of course, is the International Life Sciences Institute, uh, founded by a former uh, Coke vice president. Uh, they are big, and they're in 16 countries, they're really big in, in, uh, in China where they've actually had such a big role in determining China's response to, um, to obesity uh, and making it as minimally effective as possible. Um, so this is, they've, as I'll show you later, they've created their own um, whole scientific um, stream, if you like. So what else do they do? They manufacture false debate and insist on balance. And a lot of this, if you haven't read, there's a fabulous book called The Merchants of Doubt. Um, uh, by Naomi Oreskes, uh, and really, it's, and that's about climate change, it's also about tobacco, it's also about acid rain, um, it's, it's how scientists, some scientists have completely helped industries to undermine uh, effective approaches. 
Um, and what they use is insist on uh, responsible journalists cover both sides of the argument, demand balance, and they use what's called in the US the fairness doctrine, which was brought in after the Second World War legitimately to make sure that um, uh, different sides of arguments were actually presented. The point is here, say with climate change, we know that something like 97% uh, of climate change scientists believe in anthropogenic climate change. Uh, and yet uh, they're demanding 50-50 representation of every article um, in, the, in the press, even though in some uh, instances, in fact, you're getting far more uh, commentary uh, about denial of climate change than, uh, than otherwise. Um, they'll divert attention from harmful products um, and they'll focus on corporate social responsibility. Now, corporate social responsibility in some ways seems like a really, really good thing. And I would generally say it is. But in the hands of some of these groups, it's an absolute godsend. It's a smoke screen. It's cover fire for doing what you want to do. Now in Malawi where I, I work, and there's the Coca-Cola's um, foundation uh, doing work on, uh, uh, on, um, on water so they can legitimately, well, or, or illegitimately build their, uh, their business in Malawi. And the, the Malawi government has absolutely no capacity to resist them uh, uh, whatsoever. Um, and they focus on other issues as the problem, physical activity instead of diet, um, and Nestle and Coke are the absolute masters in this. Um, and I want to just pay, acknowledge a couple of our students um, at Melbourne, uh, Jen Lacey Nichols and, and uh, Sophie Lamond, just done great master's theses or, or uh, uh, doing their PhDs uh, on really interesting stuff. And this is just looking at Milo's sports development program. This is you know, presenting Milo as a, as a healthy option, of course. Um, they're working in something like 35 out of the 53 countries they sell Milo in, and it's always about physical activity. Uh, and as we've seen here, Milo cricket has become such a dominant part of the cricket scene, and they're not funding it anymore, I don't think. Um, but, you know, you ask your whose children play Milo cricket. I'm sure they, they do here. It's, it's, um, uh, it's a very strong as association. Uh, they can frame issues in highly creative ways um, and so you admit that it's a serious problem but not a life-threatening one. You admit that it may be a problem but it's less severe than everybody says. You argue it's less severe than other problems. Um, you argue that the cost of the problem is too high. This is a ripper about uh, acid rain. It's a billion dollar solution to a million dollar problem. So there's some creative thinkers there. We're going to be more, in a sense, creative than they have. Um, although they used um, colourful and derogatory imagery, like the one, this is again from the US, the watermelons. It's not so appropriate here, but it's the notion of green on the outside and red on the inside because of the sort of very strong anti-communist uh, rhetoric uh, post the McCarthy era in the US, uh, then this is used in the climate change, uh, change, climate change debate. So, so, and as we can tell from Kathy's work, um, then, uh, then the industries are highly creative. Okay? They're really thinking constantly about ways that they can actually um, circumvent uh, any potential regulatory approaches, uh, undermine any effective uh, approaches as well. They'll fund disinformation campaigns, and as I said before with the International Life Sciences Institute, they actually have created their own so-called scientific stream. So this is, in a sense, they've got conferences every year, um, they're making these broader and broader, uh, and uh, you won't find too many people that really do believe in what they're doing. They'll influence the political agenda, um, and this is the International Food and Beverage Association, the big companies. As you can see here, in, in uh, 2014, $160 million uh, donated to the members of Bra Brazil's National Congress so a threefold increase. So they're in there to win. They're not in there, they're not making these investments because they're nice. <laughs> they're making these investments to block any regulation, anything that might affect their bottom line, anything that might affect um, the way that they do business. So it's not, a, it's not a benign level playing field. This is a place where they want to kick heads and they're trying to kick ours. 
Um, the top five advertisers in the Walk 100, this is worth watching. Uh, of course, this is of everything. This is, again, backing up what Cathy was saying in terms of, of just the ubiquity of the image, I would call it. So it's constant, as we've just been shown, but it's constant with booze, it's now constant with gambling, it's now constant with, um, uh, uh, with alcohol. So the kings of Australian sport, and they're mainly the kings, not the queens, the netballers haven't been got at yet, uh, but maybe they will be, uh, or the women footballers, but they're ambassadors of booze and betting um, and junk food and junk drinks. Our little kids watch them and, and they are the ambassadors. And that's the situation um, that we have uh, uh, in Australia. So now I want to look at what are they doing um, and um, what we should do. So, and the thing that I guess worries me the most is that they're moving into the, have moved into the digital space, if you like, which is completely unregulated. Uh, and yet has limitless capacity to communicate, as we know. So we've got to work out how to use it ourselves as well. But if you look at advert games, again, Cathy just mentioned one in particular, the social networking sites, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, mobile marking, QR codes, smartphone apps, text messages, banner ads, and of course, location-based and geo-targeting. They know where you live, and they're coming for you. Um, because now we have a completely different, we've never had this, 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 this situation before where if I can market to you, I can sell a product to you, or if I can advertise a product to you, you buy it, or you just have to even like it, uh, and I can then target my ad advertising much more closely uh, than I've ever been able to have before. And if you like on uh, Facebook, something on Facebook, then there's a fair chance I'll pick up something like 97 pieces of information about you. I mean, we've been seeing this with the Cambridge An Analytica stuff, but, um, you know, they know, as I say, they, we give this information to them, unknowingly often, they then package it and they sell it back to, through strategy groups back to these uh, other groups. So they're using my data to sell it back so I can be advertised to. I mean, how weird is that? but how, in a sense, smart is it? So if you're a male and you like Mercedes and then you change your marriage status from married to single, you immediately get an offer, a test drive offer of a red open top Mercedes. <laughs> That's smart. You know, can we be smarter? So, this is what I saw the other day from a friend uh, in England who had come out recently. Um, and she, anybody who have monster drinks, but have a look at what they're actually saying. We put the camo pattern on our new monster assault can because we think it looks cool. Plus it helps fire us up to fight the big multinational companies who dominate the beverage business. Well, of course, this is owned by them. <laughs> so this is again branding capture. They're invading our space. I mean, they're using language that I use. So just think how they are working uh, and how smart they're working. They'll continue to heavily invest, invest in traditional forms of marketing. Why? Because it, it creates such good brand awareness. Um, it creates goodwill um, with the advertisers, of course. If you get, and, uh, and Australia has a particularly strong advertising industry particularly strong. I mean, not only do we have the growing transfer, but I mean, it's actually, a, they, they give more awards to each other than any other business. Um, <laughs> and, and they seriously are creative advertisers. But the point is, Australia is soaked in, ad, utterly soaked in, in uh, advertising. And of course, sponsored groups and clubs, as you've seen in Western Australia, uh, if they're offside, then it's a really tough gig. Um, and we've got to work out how to get them uh, on site. So they'll continue to encourage uh, public-private partnerships, corporate social responsibility, sponsorship. I mean, sponsorship provides funds. It provides a highly effective means of promoting their products and an avenue for blame shifting um, and very strong allegiance. 
But all the stuff around sports sponsorship, for example, by alcohol or junk food, that's just part of their marketing. You know, it's the punter who pays, we pay. It's not a piece, it's not a large S. And there's no reason why we couldn't be using, as we did with tobacco, a hypothecated tax uh, again. And of course, major repetition, we're part of the solution. Constantly telling us they are part of the solution. The new products, um, no doubt you will have seen uh, IQOS or Plume or Glow. These are uh, heat treated tobacco um, already uh, on the market in, in uh, many parts of the world. Um, they'll continue to attack scientists and scientists. They'll protect themselves from lawsuits and actually will, uh, will sue people uh, where they can, where they know they won't uh, lose. And they'll further concentrate and consolidate. This is the biggest thing I'm worried about is the size of some of these organisations. If you look at uh, this AB, AB InBev and SAB Miller, so it was number one to go, or merge with number two. So they're huge in tobacco, British American tobacco, to acquire Reynolds. Now the point about this is that you get a huge increase in what I would call dis disposable strategic financing, um, which is my own bit of bullshit, um, <laughs> but don't worry about that. But, uh, it's about having the capacity to have a huge legal in-house legal department. The capacity to have a PR department that can knock off the little guys, even your competitors or us. And, and when there are a whole lot of small ones, you don't actually have that capacity to do it. And now in legal firms, uh, it used to be, you know, for a law graduates, pretty uncool to go and work for an in-house group. Now, because they're so big, it's much cooler. Um, and they will expand their, their way of trying to get susceptible researchers. Of course, the foundation for a smoke-free world, which you'll know about, uh, headed by Derek Yak, a billion dollars from Philip Morris over the next 10 years. Um, extraordinary. A foundation for a smoke-free world. Oh, please. You know, Philip Morris is going to want that? Because what the, and this is another one, the National Institutes of Health, starting a $100 million clinical trial to test whether a drink a day really does prevent attacks. 65, 67 million is coming from these groups. What result are they going to get? I don't know. <laughs> so what we need to do is actually establish the science of corporatology. So this is about us really monitoring the production of, of alcohol and unhealthy foods and beverages, cost availability, advertising, sponsorship, donations, funding, the environments, the regulatory and legislative environments. Um, because um, we need to do it in a, way, and I'll go, uh, in a way that we do with other vectors of diseases. Now, with malaria, we monitor mosquitoes. Well, these are the vectors of the 21st century uh, uh, pandemics. We need to monitor them. It should be part of state and federal government um, public health uh, surveillance systems. I know we're probably a long way off from that, but this is where it should be. I mean, this is what's actually happening. Um, we also have to realise that our opposition is not just industries, that the enemies of regulation have become the enemies of science. That's particularly big in the US, but it's also here. So it's not just industries who, who don't want to see effective public health approaches. Um, but we do need to monitor them, as I said, uh, as a normal part of public health surveillance. There's a fabulous work being done by the South a uh, East Asian Tobacco Control Alliance, Mary Asanta and, and uh, uh, et al. that do this work on the Tobacco Industry Interference Index. So they're following these people really as closely as they can. Uh, and we need to do that across and make it systemic and organised um, and, uh, uh, and built into what we're, uh, what we're doing. Um, we need to really uh, realise that our supporters and collaborators aren't just from public health um, or on the political left. You know, there's a whole lot of other industries that we can work with, as I mentioned before, whether it's around general insurance or life insurance or whether it's around telcos uh, or whether it's around now some uh, investment banks um, and we can look for disinvestment. Uh, some of you will know Bronwyn King has done a fabulous job in disinvesting from uh, uh, getting superannuation funds to, from, to disinvest from, uh, um, uh, from tobacco uh, portfolios. And we have to win the hearts and minds and a sense psychological wallets 
uh, of the public. And that's why we do need well-funded uh, social media campaigns with extensive coverage. That's why we need Live Lighter. You, uh, I mean, the, the impact of, so, of social, large social media campaigns is like advertising for, for junk food. I mean, it's, it's counter that. It does change people's behaviour, it does change the environment so that we can get better policy. That's probably as important as the uh, individual behaviour change. It provides an opportunity uh, for much bigger things to go. And we need to expand and develop a new public health workforce. We need digital strategists and marketers, business analysts, investment bankers, lobbyists, investigative researchers, advocates and of course public health lawyers. So you need to find new friends, okay? and find some of them that might have crossed over from the dark side. Or even if they're on the dark side, talk to them, learn from them. Because we need to understand their world. They're in a world that we're not really competing with uh, in the moment, and these are some of the links and references, and I have to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay up here, please, because we're now going to have our panel uh, discussion with our three guest speakers. And I hope everyone has some questions to ask of our panelists. Um, have we got microphones? We have, Vicky? So can I um, first, uh, and I'll do this at the conclusion of this panel session, thank each of our speakers for terrific presentations, uh, different perspectives across um, this very important and emerging area. I love it. I think that um, um, the sooner we as public health advocates um, in any job that we do realise that um, we've got a fight on our hands, and we've got to understand the real vectors. The, too often in the past we've concentrated on individuals and uh, as Rob illustrated in one of his concluding remarks, the real job of Live Lighter is not so much to try and change people's uh, behaviours but rather till the soil for appropriate and uh, proportionate regulatory change so that people uh, find the, the healthy choices, the, the easier choices. And we've done it with tobacco. Uh, we've got a bit of a rearguard um, fight back happening with Philip Morris and their Smoke Free Foundation. We've got some lunatics running around the countryside promoting e-cigarettes as the solution to all our problems. They're on the same bandwagon. Um, but we have proved that if we um, run uh, awareness campaigns that equip the public with uh, appropriate information, um, tell them how serious the issue is, then eventually the politicians do follow and introduce appropriate regulation. That, that's really our, our end goal. But enough from me. Um, questions, please. Please go ahead. We have a microphone coming to your door. We know where you live. <laughs> um, hey, thanks everybody. I loved all of those talks. Um, I am going to try and be concise, but it's not a particular skill of mine, so sorry if I, if I ramble a little bit. Um, my question's for Rob. Um, I'm, I'm a community worker, and there's probably a lot of people who are here who are also just the little community worker. Um, and, and we have really cool health promotion ideas, and we want to work with business, but it doesn't seem um, in some ways like um, maybe population health organisations or community, little community organisations where we're kind of ready to join forces with business or to kind of allow a space where we would work with business, particularly around um, creating new businesses. And so I'm just curious, like, do we need to go and get MBAs before we can justify why we need to do that? Or how would we justify to, to our own departments why it's important that we, that we do that? Great question. Um, I, I mean, 
Kirsten will give you one fabulous example about how she's worked with, with businesses, um, local business. The question should be directed really to her. But I think it's finding people you can work with. And, and the thing that Kirsten really focused on, I thought which was brilliant, is about the, the relationships. And it will be about those relationships. So what's in it for them? What's in it for you? Um, so I would go looking. Don't necessarily learn, uh, need an MBA. Do you have an MBA? No. Uh, she has an MPH. Um, and she's a physio. Uh, so, you know, great change. I, th I thought that was a brilliant presentation. But the sort of creativity involved in it, thinking what's in it for them and what's in it for us and how can we go about it, means that, and I think there's so much, in this instance, there's so much room for local creativity and local mobilisation, and that's where it has to start. Because at the moment, the politicians fear the industries more than they fear the voters. So until we do enough mobilisation so that they really do respect the voters, um, then we have a uh, we have an ongoing battle, I guess. And um, if I can just add, everybody can be an advocate. Um, um, exactly. Uh, we we saw the story of the two um, Derby captains uh, promoting that ridiculous, unhealthy burger. And in the paper this morning, there's a terrific letter from a, a lecturer in public health at Edith Cowan pointing out the stupidity of that and uh, the fact that these fellows are role models mm -hmm. and that kids look up to them. And um, it uh, prompted me to think that we need to visit both the West Coast Eagles and uh, Fremantle football clubs to see what connections we can both exploit and how we can work with them to present alternative messages and uh, perhaps even prod their consciences about their, um, their new sponsors because they're having a huge amount of influence over the community and we're just not having as much as we would, uh, we would desire. Cathy, did you want to answer in part that question? Well, I think the role of um, community health workers is about empowering the community and it goes back to that Ottawa Charter um, principle, empower the community, which is not always a, an easy thing to do, but it's about giving the community a voice and um, I think, you know, I at Cancer Council we can do these surveys showing it's two thirds of the community are in support of this, but it's getting those local stories, getting those people to write the letters to the editor, write to local council and saying, I just think these, these bus shelters are ridiculous. Um, you know, whether it's at that local level or whether it's about the, the football matches that people um, are going to. But because the politicians are not hearing enough of these negative stories about what impact it's having on um, families, they think it's all right when McDonald's comes in and says, oh, we'll lose jobs about that, and that becomes a much more powerful argument. Thanks. I would we'll just add, I guess, that mobilising communities is really important and that protects... Um, decision makers often at higher levels if a community is expecting or supportive of something taking place. Um, the other thing, when we've tried new things, I think you need to be really prepared as the professional in that situation to um, take the blame if it doesn't go well and if it does go well you give the credit um, to somebody else and the examples we talked about, I guess I didn't touch on it too much, but when we did some really good things around drinks with Eli who was the retailer um, in that space, I'd go to our CEO, Andrew Way, and I'd say, "Can you, when next time you go down to get your coffee, um, instead of not engaging, which would be his normal behaviour, I said, can you see Eli, can you shake his hand, can you acknowledge what's happening? And so then it would only be a few hours later and Eli would tap me on the shoulder. You'd never guess who spoke to me today, he'd say. And, and so little things like that, trying to think within your community, who is going to be really positive and give some of the credit um, that just really supports people to go you know, further along with what their journey is. Exactly. Okay, other questions? Just while you're... Oh, excellent. Krista. Thanks very much. That were, they were fantastic presentations. Um, I'm in the North Metro Health Service and like all other WA health systems, um, we follow the healthy options policy um, and that uses a traffic light system for food outlets that are WA health owned and operated. And um, we're finding that the vending we have an issue with our vending machines and so one of the things that we've um, just got permission to do is a comprehensive survey of our vending machines and we're actually collecting not only information on 
what's actually in them and we're getting help from some students to analyse that. But also asking about the contracts that are being held with the vending machine operators which appear to be quite ad hoc. And what we're planning on doing is then presenting some options to, I guess, help the vending machines better comply with the policy. And I'm curious to hear, um, Kirsten, whether you had a look around to see how other people were doing things perhaps in other jurisdictions to help that alignment or whether you just went, OK, well, we've got this tendering process, let's try and fit something in there. Uh, I guess our work around vending probably started about six years ago when really no one was doing anything much um, about healthy vending. We, I guess, were in the fortunate situation where no one had given our vending contract any attention uh, for a long time. So it was actually out of contract. Um, the provider was just still continuing to provide. We'd done nothing um, to renew. So we had that opportunity there to kind of go hard and set some new expectations. Uh, we certainly have worked with other settings who've got existing contracts in place and they really are going to keep struggling um, until they get to that point where they can start influencing a new contract. Um, I guess what we ended up doing with vending providers that, that did help is actually start saying if you could have 20% of the content being read. Um, we weren't saying we were too concerned about what was in those red items, um, but that gave you five options or six options you can put in a snack vending machine that are read. So choose them and then the rest needed to be those other options. Rather than just slowly progressing closer towards, um, we actually just said this is what a compliant vending machine would look like. We did take a stand right at the very start, you know, six years ago around energy drinks though, and uh, we wouldn't allow energy drinks in our vending machines, um, even in the red spots. Thanks, Kirsten. Hello, I'm Patricia Marshall and thank you very much for those presentations to the three speakers. Um, my question's mainly for Cathy and Rob. I think it's pretty clear to everybody by now that the self-regulation of advertising to children isn't working, isn't effective. Uh, and it's time we had some rules that uh, really were effective. What's stopping that next step? Political will. Really. So I think you know we've we've definitely got the evidence. Um, we keep continuing to show it with those um, repeated um, television uh, advertising studies. But again, it's you know the food industry and the um, you know the advertising bodies can walk into um, the politicians' office and say exactly the the opposite around that. So it is about continuing to push push that evidence under their nose. Um, but I think what we've really been missing is the strong community support to show um, how that can help to persuade as, as well. So I don't know whether we've got to have 10 years worth of evidence, which we're coming up to now, saying that industry self-regulation's not worked, we've got to get moving, moving on it. Um, I hope that the last study showing the sort of the direct impact of how it's changing children's behaviours, that'll be met by, oh, that's just one study, that was only 160 kids, but gee, that was hard to, to capture them all um, to do it. Um, you know, we keep building up around that, but we've got to keep building in the, um, the community stories and go and create that pincer movement around political decision makers. It's not just something that we want to be talking to the health ministers about, but we want their um, other colleagues, um, you know, that sit with them around the parliamentary table not to scoff when they hear this as a proposal. Absolutely, I back up what Cathy is saying. I mean, when we tried with the t task force in 2010, really around banning of advertising to children, then um, uh, Nicola Oxen was all for it, but Conroy wasn't, who was communications. So, and, and neither was Swan, as far as I know, the treasurer. So, you've really got to build that um, sort of collective capacity within a government. Um, and we need more lobbyists, well, sorry, we need even a quarter of the lobbyists. You know, we, I mean, you know, just to advise the Heart Foundation and the Cancer Council, um, we probably need to increase, you know, three or fourfold the lobbyists live in Canberra and do lobbying every day and, in a sense, because that's what the industry is doing. You know, every time we'd go and see the minister, they'd been there before and after us. Um, and it is, as I said, the big things that they feared at, the mo at that time is why a tax on... Um, uh, sugary, dis sugary drinks didn't go anywhere, I think, was the mining tax and the carbon tax. Both failed because of the power of the mining industry. 
So, you know, this is where, as I was trying to mention before, where power lies. We've got to work smarter and faster and, and uh, uh, more creatively around those um, power structures that exist and, and influence them in a different way. And, and it can be done. I mean, it can be done with personal stories. You know, it can be done with associations of, of politicians that, that um, are directly impacted by these issues themselves. So it's not impossible at all. It's just a question. I think we have to change tack and, and work slightly differently compared to how we've worked um, even with tobacco. Hi, my name's Heather O'Malley from North Metro Public Health. I just wanted to ask, um, one of the messages that I've heard this morning is just in terms of um, all the um, different campaigns and different messaging, like and even in terms of Live Lighter, um, nationally it's, it's got different brandings and then on the other side of the coin you're talking about, um, you know, the importance of branding for Coca-Cola. Um, the, you know, you say McDonald's or Burger King or Hungry Jacks and everyone knows, like, just in one word what you're talking about um, and the collaborations of all the dear, um, beer companies. And I just wondered whether um, there's just too many messages and too many campaigns and um, we're, we're all sort of competing with each other for the um, prevention space um, alongside the demise of ANFA um, and whether we need to collaborate more as with one voice about prevention in general? Well, I, th I think all the, the Live Lighter messages have all got their own particular purpose. So, you know, the, to bring in the physical activity, to bring in the fruits and vegetables, which has been so neglected since um, the Go For Two and Five campaign. So I don't see that they're... Um, necessarily competing with each with each other amongst that but it's still trying to be that counter against the um, you know what all those other big co big companies are so I think it's about us all thinking about what's our particular campaign activities we might be doing at a particular time and knowing when it's a great time to be reinforcing what's going to be on air at the the time so a physical activity is being aired from from months, you know, September to November, that's a great time for the community work to be reflecting that. And when, you know, vegetable time is going to be happening, it's a great time to be thinking about what we can doing um, to link all of that together. But I think if we start thinking, oh, let's only go for the physical activity, then we're going to be forgetting the fruits and vegetables that we know that only, you know, um, one in, oh, um, you know, so few people are meeting those those recommendations that we, we can't be letting go of go of that. And you know, again, coming as the Sydney person where we don't have these great big mass media campaigns happening, we've only got Make Healthy Normal, which is not really selling a very hard message at all. There isn't a good thing to be coming under the umbrella of. And can I say that, that health promotion and public health, um, they're team games. And your point about collaboration, um, is really important and I think that if anybody, everybody here can find someone new to work with after this meeting, then the meeting's really achieved something really, really worthwhile, let alone listening to us. Um, uh, but seriously, I mean, it is a team game and, and if you look at, you know, the 36 uh, groups assigned on tipping the scales, that's the start of something. You know, we have to be able to move from being cottage industries to being big industries. Uh, to being a big industry that we can start to compete. But if we are, and you're right, if we, we stay too divided, too separate, too competing, we've got to work out how to make the pie bigger for all of us rather than compete over a smaller pie. We've got time for two more questions. Christina. Hi, um, Christina Pollard from East Metro. Um, my question is really about the partnerships that government has with um, industry at the moment. Unlike tobacco, uh, the food industry is really at the policy table for many of the big decisions made by governments at all levels, I think. Um, and it's, you know, the mantra is, you, you know, you have to eat food. You don't have to smoke or you don't have to drink. But I think it's really um, worrying the influence that 
and they're multinational companies or collaboratives like the AFGC who are undermining or watering down the decisions that governments are able to make at the moment. So I just wondered about your comment on that. Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, that's what I was trying to point out. I mean, they, they have far too... We, we knew with the, the Preventive Health Task Force that we didn't have to have tobacco around the table, but we didn't have to have food and, and alcohol. Uh, and they both constantly undermined what was going on. Um, I think the point now is uh, everybody needs to eat healthy food. People do not need to eat unhealthy food. So there's a difference there in terms of the discussion. Um, and, you know, we and, and you, in a sense, have to make that clear to, uh, to governments constantly that they should not be around uh, the policy table. Their, their conflict of interest is way, way too strong. Uh, it has to be pointed out again and again and again and again. Um, ad, ad, ad vergeim nosim. And um, I'm not sure if you noticed in The Australian the other day that um, the federal government's putting together the new alcohol strategy for the next three, three to five years and Greg Hunt relented and, and invited the alcohol industry to a seat at the table. And um, we, we shouldn't tolerate um, th those people determining government policy, but such is their power um, that they are able to, um, to get a seat there and, and at the moment the only ones that are excluded um, are the tobacco industry, not least because of Article 5.3 in the FCTC. So last question, um, Marg Miller. Hello, I'm Margaret Miller from ECU and also from the World Public Health Nutrition Association. Um, Rob, this is a question for you again, um, following on Christina's question. There seems to be an awful lot of focus on public-private partnerships um, from the World Health level down and uh, I, I see this as a great concern from, uh, for healthy food promotion. How do we actually counter that sort of um, uh, focus, policy focus, because we really are seeing it, as I said, from, from WHO level down and, and it's happening in our own government um, circles as well. Thanks, Margaret. I mean, A, it's a sort of, uh, I guess, publicise what the, what the real agreements are, what the partnerships are and, and what, what the different entities are going to get out of it. Um, I agree with you. I mean, one of the most recent ones is the agreement between, I think, Heineken and the Global Fund. Um, for promotion around you know, HIV prevention in, uh, uh, in, in Southern Africa. I mean, excuse me. Um, but that's the sort of thing. And it's also, also, but it also stems in, the, in a bigger world of, of the public sector, governments can't do this, we need to rely on the private sector. Uh, as we're seeing in the US, a constant undermining of the tax base in a country um, so that there'll be less available in the public sector anyway. I mean, you know, the most inspiring countries are obviously in northern Europe, Scandinavians, where there's a strong commitment to public infrastructure and public uh, health and wealth. And they are the ones that do better on every, every index of well-being. Every index of well-being, they're doing much better than those and they have a, a lower level of inequality. So, you know, they're doing much better because of the way society is structured. So it's bigger than just a public-private partnership. These public-private partnerships are coming out of uh, the notion that somehow um, governments can't deliver and um, uh, we need the private sector. You know, I'm fine with public-private partnerships as long as the, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, they aren't using them for, uh, for um, unhealthy commercial gain. But, um, you know, again, they have to be, uh, focused on and exposed for, for what they are. But it comes back to the point about what can we do at the local level. Let's keep trying to push for finding partners where we can have public-private partners, but ones where, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a health and wealth gain, not just a, uh, a wealth gain. More relationships like Eli. Yeah. <laughs> Eli, Eli, Eli. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid we're going to have to draw that panel discussion to a close. Can you join with me in thanking our guests for a three fantastic presentations?